Hello there, this is Anthony, and I welcome you to Book Talk. At Book Talk, we get to have an author come and tell us about his book or her book. And today is a great day. We have a great guest with us, with whom I'm going to bring right now. But before we go into that, I know you've been experiencing a lot in the recent past. I mean, you've been forced to make changes that we are, you are not expecting, and maybe you are not welcoming. This is why we have the guest with us here, who is known as Erica Anderson. Welcome to the show, Erica. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Yes, and uh, we are glad that you chose us and uh, you chose this time to come and tell us about change, something that is <laughs> a very interesting topic. Now, before we go into detail, let's introduce Erica to you. Erica Anderson is a, the founding partner of a coaching, consulting, and a training firm known as Proteus International that focuses on leader readiness. Now, Erica has a great experience in consulting and advising many major uh, companies, name of Amazon, Spotify, and others. And this is why we are here because she's gonna give us a wealth of experience on change. And uh, she's an author, she's written several books, but the book that we are going to focus on is her latest one known as uh, Change from the Inside Out, making you, your team and your organization change capable. So we are going to have a great ride. Thank you very much. Now, Erica, before I continue talking and saying anything more, maybe you'd like to tell us a bit more of what I may have left out as I am introducing you. Maybe you can even mention one or two books that you've written before, and uh, let's get to know you. Okay, I'd love to do that. So yeah. um, I'll say a little bit about my company, Proteus. I started it in 1990. And you and your listeners might be interested to know um, why, the, re the reason I started my company. So this was in the late 80s and the skills that are so important for us now, leadership, management, teaming, communication, those were 30 years ago called soft skills. Like they don't really matter. You know, they're not really your job skills. And it seemed to me that those skills as the world sped up and flattened out were just going to become more and more important. In fact, our first tagline for Proteus was Proteus, skills for mastering the future. And that's what I wanted to do is create a company that could help people acquire those skills and that mindset. So, so that's what we did the 30 years ago and it's worked well. And over the course of that, starting 15 years ago, I started to write books. And the first one was Growing Great Employees, How to Be a Good People Manager. Mm -hmm. Next one is called Being Strategic, then Leading So People Will Follow. And the last one I wrote before this book on change was called Be Bad First. And it was about how to be a good learner. And the, the reason I named it that was because in order to learn something new, you have to be willing to be bad at it first. You have to be willing to be a novice first. And that's hard for us as adults. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit about my history. Ah, beautiful. So for you to do something good, you must do it fast, badly, and then you do it good. And uh, that brings us to change. I, I mean, it, at the beginning of everything that has been happening, and I don't have to repeat what has been happening in the last two years, um, some of us adapted to it very badly. <laughs> <laughs> now we are glad that you're here because uh, you bring us some insights on how to handle it right. Yeah. So um, how did you come to write? I mean, what inspired you to write now this? Is it the pandemic or many other things were going on that drove you to write about change? Yeah, I actually started thinking about the book a couple of years before the pandemic in 2018. And so it's been true for each one of my books. I, I write a book when I get curious about something. I want to crack an important code for people. So we've had a change practice at Proteus for about 10 years. And I think we're very good at helping people integrate the kind of practical side of change with the human side of change. Mm -hmm. And there were still two questions that I really got curious about and wanted to answer. And the first one was, as I noticed what was happening as we helped our clients with change, why is change so hard for us? 
I really wanted to get clear about that because it is, right? It's it like, is, just, it oh God, this is hard. So I wanted to answer that question. Mm -hmm. And then the other question I wanted to answer was, what actually happens when we go through a change? When an individual person makes a change, what happens mentally and emotionally? Mm -hmm. So I started out writing the book to answer those two questions. And I feel like I got good answers, which I'm happy to share with your listeners, yeah. and which I share in the book. Uh -huh. And then I was very happy to see that the answers to those questions really lined up with and re reinforced our approach to change, which I also talk about in the book. But let me, can I start with what I, the answers I found to those two questions? We'll be glad to hear them. Okay, okay. Yeah, but 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 first, even we go, before yeah. we go into that, let, let's have an idea of why is it so hard uh, for us to accept it? I mean, what, what, what brings that? That challenge for us to accept change, even before you well, go. That, that's, yeah, that's exactly where I wanted to go because that yeah. was the first thing I thought about, okay. right? So, so I thought about it and I thought, you know, we really, uh, a good place to look for answers to questions like this is always history, the history mm -hmm. of humanity, because we are, you know, we come from what we've been. So, so I thought, okay, so think about a person's life 100 or 200 or 500 years ago. That person's life, was very similar from beginning to end. That mm -hmm. person's life didn't change much, right? So yeah. if you were born 200 years ago in Kenya or in the United States or in Greece, your life was probably very much like your parents' life. Mm -hmm. You probably lived in the same place, grew up in the same place. You probably did the same work that your parents had done, ate the same food, went to the same church. It was very predictable, very almost, we think of it as, stable right yeah yeah and when a change came 100 or 200 years ago it was almost always a danger or a threat it was a famine or a war or a flood right mm -hmm. or a plague it was something bad and so almost without exception the best bet was always to go back to that previous norm as quickly as you could yeah. so that's how we're wired over thousands of years to think that when change comes it's bad it's dangerous mm -hmm. and what we have to do is get back to our previous state as quickly as possible mm -hmm. and so if you think about it that wiring really served us well for thousands of years but then starting in the 20th century as everything started to speed up and life started to change now that wiring that served us so well doesn't serve us anymore. Mm -hmm. That that um, immediate sense that oh change is bad, which we still have because mm -hmm. that doesn't go away in a generation, you know. And change is now there is so much change. The amount of change that happens for us on a daily basis probably didn't happen in a whole person's life a hundred years ago. Yeah, right. I agree with that. <laughs> Over the last 50 or 60 years, it's really sped up. At the beginning of the book, I start with this story of when I was a little kid, we got our first TV. Okay. Because I'm old enough that TV was a new thing. When I was a little kid, we got our first TV. And it wasn't until 10 years later that we got our first color TV. Mm -hmm. So that's how slow change was even 60 years ago. It took 10 years for that level of technological innovation, which now happens every half hour on our telephones, you know what I mean? And so <laughs> yeah. even, even since then, it's sped up and sped up. So, so my uh, belief came to be, as I understood this, well, then we have to rewire ourselves mm -hmm. to be able to be what I've come to call change capable, to mm -hmm. be able to be good at change, to not immediately think of change as bad, to see it neutrally, and then to help ourselves through it. Does that all make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. yeah. And, and so and that led me to my next question, which was, well, what actually happens when we do go through a change, when we don't resist it, when we actually make a change? Mm -hmm. So did a lot of observation and asking of people. And we saw this fascinating thing that we came to call the change arc. So the first thing that happens when a change comes at us, you know, somebody tells us we're going to have to change is, and we call this proposed change, we want some information. And the information that we want about the change is remarkably predictable. We always want to know three things. Mm -hmm. We want to, what does this mean for me? Meaning, what am I going to have to do differently, right? Yeah. Second thing we want to know is, why is this happening? Right? Because yeah. we have such a preference for the status quo that we need good reasons to change. Yeah, yeah, and sure. Then, Right. And then the third thing we want to know is what will it look like when it's done? What will it look like post change? Because mm -hmm. 
again, we have this fear of the unknown. So if you're going to tell me I need to change, tell me what will come after, what will it look like? Mm -hmm. So start gathering that information. Always when you, when you tell people they're going to have to change, you start getting these kinds of questions. Well, what does it mean? Why is it happening? What will it look like? But even as we start to gather this information, and this is where, we, where it got really interesting, we noticed that people's initial mindset about a change almost always is that the change, they predict negativity. They predict to themselves, we predict to ourselves mm -hmm. that the change is going to be difficult and costly and weird. <laughs> right? Yeah, and difficult yeah. means I don't know how to do it and it's going to be hard to do and other people are going to get in the way of me doing it. It means difficult just means obstacles, right? Yeah, yeah. Costly means it's going to take away from me things that I value. Making this change is going to take things away from me. Mm -hmm. And it might be simple things like time or money, but it's likely to, we're likely to feel that it's going to be more important things like identity mm -hmm. and reputation and relationships and power and freedom, that it's going to take all these things from me that I value, right? Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. assume that. And then weird just means strange. Like this is not how we do stuff around here. It just seems strange, right? Yeah. So that's how we start out thinking about it. And then we noticed really carefully and we saw that when people actually do make a change, it's because their mindset shifts mm. and they start thinking to themselves it, rather than difficult, costly and weird. They start thinking, oh, I can see how this change could be easy or at least doable, right? Yeah. I can see how it could be rewarding. It could give me more than it takes away. And I can see how it could be normal. And normal in this sense means uh, other people like me do it, people that I think of as being my peers do it, mm -hmm. and people who I admire and want to emulate do it, which is why it's so important for bosses to model change, because that's part of how we start thinking it's going to be normal. Mm -hmm. And we notice that as soon as someone not, not as soon as the change got easy, but as soon as people, a person thought it could be easy, rewarding and normal. Just It's just all in our minds, right? Mm -hmm. As soon as mindset shifts, then we're open. We start being open to the change and we start being willing to learn the new behaviors and the new understanding and the new ways of operating that the change requires and the change can occur, mm -hmm. which is now you see why the book is called Change from the Inside Out, because we really whether it's one person changing or a company of 50,000 people changing, when that change will actually be adopted and take place is when people make that internal mindset shift to where they can accept the possibility of the change being a good thing yeah. and they're willing to behave differently. Mm. Differently. So, uh, I mean, so it comes from the end, the inside is the mind mindset shift that, that is going to, uh, I mean, once we shift our mindset and we embrace change, then that's how it's going to be accepted. Exactly, mm. exactly. And there's this uh, very famous statistic from McKinsey that says 70% of organizational change efforts fail, 70%. Mm -hmm. 70 then they, yeah. And then they go on to say <laughs> that research shows that the reason why is, as they say, lack of um, management support and employee buy-in. And when I read that statistic, I thought, oh, because their mindsets haven't shifted. Mm -hmm. They're just like, no, this is going to be bad. It's going to be hard. It's going to take away things I value. I'm not doing it. So all of the big organizational changes that focus just on the nuts and bolts part of it and don't attend to that human side of it are more likely to fail. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, right, right. I agree. Now, you've been uh, to many companies up and down, and um, uh, you've been in association with the leaders there. And I guess at some point, you've also been as in association with the employees or the, the wider part of the organization. Where did you experience much difficulty in change? Is it in the leaders or in the subordinates? It's a wonderful question. So in the book, when I'm, you know, uh, as I, in the chat, most of the chapters I spend, after I explain what I just explained to you and to your listeners, I go through our five-step change model. And those chapters, I kind of uh, break up into leaders, 
individuals and the organization itself. Mm -hmm. So my feeling is that both, that it's leaders and individuals. The, the problem with, so let's start with leaders. One of the things that we realized and that we communicate to leaders when we help them and coach them and support them through change is, you know, when you get on an airplane and they say, they're talking about the oxygen masks and they yeah. say, if the oxygen masks come down, put on your own mask before attempting to help others. Mm -hmm. Well, the same thing with leaders in change. Mm -hmm. Leaders often try to make change happen without going through it themselves. Uh -huh. And that, and, and we say to them, no, you, you literally have to go through it yourself first. First of all, you have to make that interior mindset shift so that you really do understand and see and feel the benefits of the change so that you yourself see how this change could be easy, rewarding, and normal. And then, then you can turn to people and encourage them to go through the change and you'll have credibility because they're looking to you to see whether or not you've actually done it yourself. And most of us who work in corporations have been in situations where a leader is trying to make us do something that they themselves have not done. Mm -hmm. And we just don't believe them, right? <laughs> so yeah, and I, and, for leaders to do it first. And I get now why John Maxwell says that everything rises or falls on leadership. Exactly. If the leadership is failing, then the company is failing. The individuals are failing. If the leaders are going to accept and embrace change, then the individuals will embrace change and the organization will change in yep. the direction that they would desire. Yeah, yep. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with that. And, you know, I've seen with uh, some of our clients, like there's one client that we have that's trying to go through is will go through is in the process of going through a really major change in how they do business around technology. Mm -hmm. And the president of the organization is a very honest, transparent person. And he has led them through other changes pretty well. Mm -hmm. So he has a lot of credibility with the organization. Mm -hmm. And they, they trust, and, and he has really, it's, it's been fun for me watching him. He's really gone through this change in his own mind and understood what it will mean to the organization, what he's going to have to do differently. So when he turns to the organization and says, we're doing this, it'll take a couple of years, but it's really important to the organization, they believe him. He has mm -hmm. credibility with the organization, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you're ready so, to yeah. change, then others will be ready to change. Precisely. And then when you get down to the individual level, the most important thing is to, as leaders and through the organization, to support people making that mindset shift, mm -hmm. right? And then really giving them the tools, the training, the support, whatever it is they need to actually behave in the new ways. Because mm -hmm. those are the two things that go together. There's that uh, mental, the psychological thing of helping people make that shift towards seeing the change as potentially easy, rewarding, normal. But then there's making it really clear to them, okay, here are the new behaviors that these changes are gonna require. Here are the skills you need. We'll teach them to you. We'll show you how to do it. Here are the tools, here are the processes. So that when they go through that mindset shift, then you can support them to actually do things differently, which is what the change is about, right? Mm, beautiful. And, and, and here, when you mention about the tools, I mean, talk of the tools and resources that are going to encourage that change. Can you give us maybe a, a layman's language or maybe a few examples of the tools and resources that people use in the change? Well, so I'll, I could go down two paths with that. I could tell you our kind of five-step change model, which we use to help an organization go through change. Okay. But I think what you're talking about, and I'd love to explain that, but I think what you're talking about is the specific tools to help a person change. And that's, in, in my experience, is specific to the change. Okay. Like, for instance, if you, let's say, I'll just make this up. Let's say that you're a, a manufacturing company and you're changing your production process, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So the tools that people are going to need once they've gone through the mental shift are, are there, does this production process require new skills? Okay. okay then can you teach those skills? 
is there a new process? Can you show me the process? Can you line out the steps of the process? So to actually make it as explicit as possible, what the new approach, the new process, the new system, the new way of operating is, and that's specific to the change. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does make yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, so, uh, it me makes sense, yeah. But so I'll, I'll take you through our five-step model, which I think your listeners will find useful. So okay. um, the first step is clarify the change and why it's needed. Okay. And usually a change in an organization starts at a fairly senior level. There are some couple of senior people who think to themselves, we're going to have to make this change. And sometimes they just kind of roll into it without getting clear about it. Mm -hmm. And so that's what this first step is. Get really clear. What is the change that you're trying to make and why is it needed? Mm -hmm. And the why is it needed is really interesting. A lot of times because a change happens on senior, starts being thought about by senior leaders, they think about the why that's meaningful to them. So like, for instance, senior leaders might go, oh, if we make this change, the company will be much more profitable. Okay, so that's really meaningful to them, maybe mm -hmm. because they're Compensation is tied to profit, right? Yeah. But that may not be meaningful at all to some person who's going to make $16 an hour, no matter how profitable the company is, right? Mm -hmm. You have to think about why the change might be beneficial to them. So it might be things like the client will like it better, or you won't have to do as much um, administrative work, or it will happen more quickly, or you'll have more time to focus on higher level work. You know, these things could be compelling reasons for most of the people who will be affected. Mm -hmm. So we really encourage in this first step for people to think about the why that's going to be meaningful to the people who are going to be affected by the change which senior leaders quite often don't. So they're thinking about this on behalf of the organization. Okay, then the second step is envision the future state, mm -hmm. what it will look like when the change is done. Now you notice that these three things, what the change is, why it's happening, and envision the future state are exactly the information that people wanna know when they hear about the change. Yeah. So senior leaders getting clear about this in the first couple of steps, then in the third step, when they start bringing other people into the tent, they can share that with them and help them through their change arc. Mm -hmm. So in the third step, you, you form the change team. Now, if it's a small company, it might be the same group that's been thinking about it. But in a larger company, the change team is likely to be a separate, slightly lower level team that's going to drive and manage the change through the organization. Mm -hmm. So you bring them in, bring them up to speed with the thinking you've done in the first couple of steps. And you also think about what we call key stakeholders who are the, there may be other people in the organization who, who aren't either on the senior team or on the change team, but who are critical to the change. That if you don't get them on board, they can really get in the way of the change. Mm -hmm. So you're bringing the key people into the tent, right? The change team and the stakeholders. And then you actually build the practical change plan. That's the main task in this third step. It's called build the change. Mm -hmm. So uh, a change is really a change is really a project. So you, it's like a big project, right? So you yeah. create a project plan and the project charter and the project schedule and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. okay. Then the fourth step is the step that almost never happens in organizations. We call it lead the transition. And it's where you figure out how to help people through the change, through that change mm -hmm. arc. Mm -hmm. So you, you first of all decide who is going, who in the organization is going to be most affected by this change. So like in our previous example with changing the production process, the people on the production line and probably the people who maintain the production line, those are going to be the people most affected. Mm -hmm. Other people in the organization may be less directly affected. So the most affected people, you think deeply about what is going to be hard for them. Why are they going to think the change is difficult, costly, and weird? And then you create a plan for helping them through their change arc. So let's say, for instance, they think it's going to be difficult because um, they, don't, they don't know how to do it. Okay, great. So how can we create a plan to hear their concerns and then share with them the new skills they're going to need to do production in the new way? So you actually build a plan to help them through. And then you layer that what we call a transition plan, that human plan on top of the practical change plan. 
and execute them together so that as you're making the practical change, you're helping people to be okay with it. You're helping them through, right? Mm -hmm. And then the last step we call keep the change going. And the reason this is important is because lots of times in organizations, people make a change and then just kind of walk away. And we say, no, keep your eye on it because there are almost always unintended consequences of a change. Mm -hmm. And you want to make sure that you tweak it so that it keeps going and that it's successful. The other thing to do in that fifth step is look at your organization and think about ways that the organization itself might be anti-change. Are there, as you've been trying to make this change, are there systems or processes or structures or even your culture that you've noticed is getting in the way of this change? And what can you do to resolve or address or fix those issues so that this change will be successful and so that future changes will be successful? That's you're making the organization more change capable. Mm. So that's that's our process. And the great thing, one of the things that I like about it is it's very... Um, it's like a Swiss army knife. It's very scopable. You can use these same five steps to plan a family vacation that mm -hmm. your kids don't want to go on <laughs> or to make a big organizational transformation with, a, you know, 100,000 people in an organization. They're the same steps, which is kind of cool. Uh, or even lead the nation. <laughs> or even lead the nation. Yes. Exactly. Because as you are talking, I'm trying to imagine. And uh, because in the beginning, we mentioned about whatever we are going through, every one of us that has affected nations and uh, the whole world, so to say. And I was imagining in this instance, we are focusing more on the leader because it, 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 as we said before, everything rises or falls on the leader. And yeah. I, I am imagining that the leader is someone that needs to be very flexible with change. Yes. And yes. Uh, we've had some very tough consequences where the, uh, leaders have refused to adapt to change. They have refused to accept it and uh, embrace it. Yes, yes. So yeah, you can see this so clearly. Mm. Um, that this and and it's you know when I started writing the book, I realized I needed a, a new word that connotes exactly what you're saying a kind of flexibility and openness and fluency with change, which is how I came up with the word change capable. Okay. That we we really in unlike our history a thousand five thousand you know all of our history mm -hmm. we need this to be change capable and leaders mm -hmm. especially that we need to be able to be going down a path and then if new information arises if a pandemic occurs if whatever happens we need to be able to um rather than uh, seeing that new change with fear with hesitation by getting stuck you know that's the reaction mm -hmm. we need to stay open and fluent and really look at it neutrally and that's the that's what i noticed about people who who have gotten good at this mindset shift mm -hmm. is they look at changes neutrally they don't necessarily think change is good because mm -hmm. all change is not good. Sometimes it's bad, but necessary. Sometimes it's bad and unnecessary, you know, but yeah. they look at it neutrally rather than with fear and negativity so that they can assess how to move forward. Right? Yeah, right. And another thing that I would like to ask you now, since with, with the experience that you've had before with the companies and uh, organizations that you're dealing with, and um, the, the tough time that we are still mentioning and where we have come up to now, where do you do you think that we are headed to? I mean, how, how should we interact? How should we look forward? What shall we expect from here henceforth? So that, I mean, where is the change going to be headed to in, in, in your experience in the previous months or so? Yeah, I think it's hard to say specifically where change is going to be headed. I think all we can say for sure is that it's going to keep speeding up. Mm -hmm. And oh. that, mm -hmm. right? And that we just have to get much better at making changes well and quickly and uh, with less resistance and negativity. Oh, okay. okay. So, as they say, change is the only constant. So, change will always happen. But, uh, yeah. We, we should not expect to go back to the days that we were. <laughs> no, we absolutely can. And that's a, that, yes, that's a really good point because, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of leaders who, 
not so much now because that Omicron kind of blew it up, but who last fall were like, okay, when can we get back to normal? Mm -hmm. And by that, they mean, they meant, when can everybody be back in the office five days a week? And I kept saying, that's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. That's just not going to happen because we've discovered over this last two years that a lot more jobs can be done remotely than we Mm -hmm. thought. Mm -hmm. We've that and we can't undiscover that we can't unsee that yeah so now we're going to have to go forward differently mm-hmm. we have both, we have these two options many jobs can be done remote or at least partly remote some jobs need to be done in person but even they can be done differently so now we have to create a new hybrid approach to work mm-hmm. and we can really think about i was just talking to a client about this yesterday she was saying you know we're trying to do this back to work thing i'm not sure how to do it And I said, you know, one thing we've been encouraging clients to do is think about which work, which meetings actually are better done in person Mm -hmm. rather than just assume that the default is doing things in person Yeah. and decide, okay, well, so it seems like our staff meetings actually work better in person. Okay. So let's do our weekly staff meeting in person. We all good with that? Yes, that makes a lot of sense. We can have better conversations. Okay, good. It seems like thing X can be done remotely. Mm-hmm. Great, let's do that remotely. You just have to think differently now about what works. Yeah. So change reveals some things that we may not have imagined of before. So that could be beneficial. Yes, yes. Yeah. Because yeah, when we are correct. talking about this new yeah. work culture, I mean, it's not only the company that is benefiting, even the employees and the individuals in the organization are benefiting in such that um, I don't have to, uh, I mean, be in traffic for two hours to get to the office. I can save those two hours and do something more in my house with my family. Precisely. And there are benefits to the, you know, I mean, there are all kinds of silver linings. If many fewer people are commuting, well, that's good for the environment. Mm -hmm. If it's good for the company because it saves them money on commercial real estate. I mean, there are all kinds of benefits, unlooked for benefits and difficulties. It's a combination, right? Yeah, it's a combination. I mean, with every change, it comes with the blessings and the difficulties. Yes. I mean, yeah. the challenges. You, you have to accept that in everything that you are going to exactly. do. There's yeah. going to be opportunity and the challenge, opportunity and the exactly. challenge. Yes. Exactly. But this one, we were initially, we were seeing this as a, a challenge only. But then we could we didn't know that there were benefits inside of it. Yeah. Now this is why we are discovering because there is change. So just accept yeah. change. Oh, exactly. beautiful! So um, <laughs> we we are glad that you came up with the book "Change from the Inside Out" and the uh, information that you've just given us, which we can find in the book. Uh, where can we get the book if we want it, to buy it? Um, Amazon or any online bookseller, you can mm-hmm. just go right there and get it. And it's uh, you can get it hard copy, Kindle, or audio, which I recorded the audio, so it's available as an audio book as well. Oh, that's beautiful! Glad to hear that. So at this point, we want to thank each and every person who's been listening. You can go and get the book "Change from the Inside Out" by Erica Anderson on Amazon or her website, which is your website, if we may get Erica Anderson. Oh, yeah, there's, exactly. There's two websites I'd like to refer people to. One mm. is my own, which is ericaanderson.com. And my name is spelled oddly, E-R-I-K-A-A-N-D-E-R-S-E-N, Erica mm-hmm. Anderson. Or my company website, which is proteus, P-R-O-T-E-U-S dash international.com. Mm-hmm. So yeah. either one of those places, you and on my website, you can find out about my podcast podcast and my other books and also it links to the Proteus website. So those are both good resources. Beautiful. And we'll share those links uh, on the uh, episodes as we are going to upload it on the different uh, platforms that we do. And uh, before we go, we'd like to thank those who have watched us live and those who are going to watch us later. And uh, we have uh, one guest uh, known as John, or rather one viewer, John Kafuenyaga says, so really our new vocabulary change capable. Capable means adopting change positively. Nice. (laughs) <laughs> I'm glad he's adopted that as a, we, I, we find it a, a really helpful frame for people that to become change capable, to become, as he said, capable of adopting change positively. So yes, I'm, I love that that 
resonating. Nothing change positively. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you very much, John. And uh, anyone who's gonna comment later. So uh, remember to share this uh, with your friends and uh, your employees, your uh, bosses, whoever. And uh, not only this live one, but also you can go to bookplacemedia.com, get it from there. All the other platforms, as Teacher, Google Podcast, Apple Podcasts, we share it as widely as we possibly can. And we are very grateful for you if you do share. And uh, don't forget the very important part of the show. Go get the book. <laughs> and uh, we really thank you, Erica Anderson. But before we go, we'd like to hear some, I call it a parting shot, something that you'd like us to remember always. Oh, okay. <laughs> the thing that I most want your listeners to remember is that they are capable of rewiring themselves in this way, that we can choose how we think, and we can choose to think about change in a more curious, hopeful, easy, rewarding, normal way. Beautiful. Thank you very much. We are really honored to have you in our show, and we wish you all the best in everything as you go impacting this message of change. And I hope people get to embrace and adapt to change. Thank you, Thank you so very much. much. Great. So it's bye and the viewers, bye also. And thank you.